Hello everybody. This is Mike Cooper at Calvary Chapel Dawdell. We're here again, once online, you know, on a Wednesday evening. And uh, we're still going through the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, tonight we're going with uh, Ecclesiastes 6, verse 1, and we're going to go up through chapter 7, verse 14. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again that we can be here and study your word and we pray lord that you walk among us here we know lord that even though we're online you can do that you can bless us with your presence and we pray that you do that we pray that you teach us lord take this from me lord and take it to your people through your voice lord you use me i pray lord just put me aside and speak to your people this evening may i ask this in jesus name amen okay Ecclesiastes 6, verse 1 through 7, verse 14. You know, anyone who listens to newscasts these days knows that the economic news is pretty bad. We're in a sad state right now. It's because of COVID-19. It's had a huge effect on our economy. In some places being described as being a return to the Great Depression. Someone has said that Recession is when your neighbor loses his job, while depression is when you use yours. Unemployment is reaching record levels in many parts of our country and around the world. To face the coming winter, a bleak and empty season, without a job is a fearful and painful experience for many people. We're all facing to one degree or another the hard times ahead. You know, that makes everyone's heart sink a little. We tend to react emotionally to these circumstances. Yet our view of life may be so distorted, distorted, distorted well, that at hard times actually do come as they may be the best years of our lives. That's what the searcher here is telling us this evening in the passages that we'll be looking at in Ecclesiastic 6 where he declares that things are not what they seem to be. We think about life as in one way and it turns out to be something quite different for us. The thesis of our passage this evening is that we may be reading everything that's happening entirely wrong. Coelness says that the prosperity may not always be good at that in the first 14 verses in chapter seven, he takes up the opposite of the company truth, that adversity may always not always be bad. What we need, of course, is a true view of good and evil. How to tell good when it is good and how to recognize evil for what it is. We would save ourselves a lot of heartache if we could just do that. The wonderful thing about scripture is that it does do just that. The searcher here gives us the true view of good and evil. In chapter 6, he, set out, he sets out four statements about prosperity to show us that material wealth and abundance is not always good. Here's his first statement here in verses 1 and 2. I have seen another evil under the sun and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor, so they lack nothing their hearts desire, but God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. You know, Amelia Coelith recognizes here that to have abundance of possessions, all that money can buy, and yet lack the power to enjoy them is a very heavy burden to bear. Many people suffer from this. You know, they drive shiny new cars, they have the latest electronic equipment in their big luxurious homes, which they're trying desperately to enjoy, yet their faces have hollowness in them. Their eyes betray an emptiness inside. On occasion, I've stepped into the casinos 
up in Reno or in Las Vegas and see what these places look like. I used to drive buses that took people to Las Vegas. These people were looking with a great hope to find riches and getting more enjoyment out of life, but they looked like death warmed over. They sat there, unsmiling, pulling those one-armed bandits, but they have no sense of enjoyment in doing this. They project no feeling that there is anything pleasure about what they're doing. Rather, they are involved in a deadly serious work, or as they, or as they work at it, or look at it. How boring that is. Observe the jaded lives of those who have everything but can't enjoy anything that they have. You know, furthermore, the searcher says material wealth and abundance can be frustrating. Imagine a stranger enjoying what you can't enjoy. Can there be anything more frustrating than getting something you've only wanted to have? There is something maybe your whole life that you wanted. And then discovering that it had lost its luster. You'd no longer enjoy it. So you pass it on to somebody else who couldn't afford it. And he had a great time with it. That would make a person very frustrated, even in, in resentful in some ways. Why couldn't I enjoy it, he asks. The key to all this is in the words. God does not give him power to enjoy. That lesson is pounded home to our hearts over and over again throughout this book. Enjoyment does not reside in increased possessions, but it's a gift that God must give. You know, if he withholds it, no amount of effort is going to extract enjoyment from anything. That's a really difficult lesson for some to learn. We are constantly bombarded with alluring pictures and catalogs and commercials that shout out at us the exact opposite message of that. Enjoyment, however, is a gift from God. The question that immediately comes to mind is, what would, what would God withhold enjoyment? Why would God withhold enjoyment? Why would he not give power to enjoy if he gives us the ability to have? You know, the answer to that question is given in this book and especially clearly stated in chapter two, verses 25 to 26, where the searcher says, for without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. To the person who pleases him. Again, I think a lot of people read that as it means that at some level of religious performance, like some standard of morality, like joining a church or coming to meetings, that's not what pleases God. We have to understand that the Christ, Christ, scriptures never say that. Faith is what pleases God. Believing Him, taking Him at His word, and acting, and acting upon His word. This is what pleases God. Obedience based upon faith. To a man or a woman like this, God gives the gift of enjoying whatever He does or has. How little or how much that may be is a gift poured out and taken from his hand. That's why gratitude, to be grateful for what you get, is the most important element in our lives. How contrary this is to the spirit of our age. No shouting at us on every side today is the philosophy that we have a right to things. Television commercials in particular constantly tell us this. They hold up some alluring object that they want you to buy and accompany it with, with propaganda line that says in one way or another, you deserve this. You've got it coming to you. If you were being treated rightly, this is what you ought to have. That's the spirit of our age. Do we realize that that can contradicts with the teaching that the Bible sets forth about our relationship to God? You know, how can we have gratitude if we are 
only getting what we deserve. We can't be grateful for that. Gratitude comes when we feel we don't deserve something, but we get it anyway. All through the scriptures we're told that the proper relationship of the believer to God and that which pleases him is to give thanks for everything. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 of the NIV. You know, this book of wisdom exhorts us to receive everything with a grateful heart. Realize that we don't have it coming. Then it's a gift from God. Even if it's painful for the moment. There is a wise father who has chosen it for you. And it will yield to you great and rich benefits. You know, you can be grateful for the pain as well as the pleasure. That's the lesson of this book. The searcher's second statement is that long life in a big family without the gift of enjoyment is to accompany us a grievous and hurtful thing in verses 3 and 4. It says a man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. If it comes without meaning, it departs in the darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Even a big family, which usually brings much cheer, excitement, and pleasure to life, even a long life, and many children and grandchildren will not of themselves meet man's deep hunger and contentment. It will still leave him listless, unhappy, perhaps involved in quarrels and family strife, leaving the heart unsatisfied. Without the gift of enjoyment, nothing will satisfy. Nothing will produce long-lasting joy. In cases like this, the searcher says, even a stillborn baby is better off. The writer goes or gives reasons for this. First, a stillborn infant has no history to live down. It says, though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has no more rest than does that man. That uh, that does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not go to the same place. Do they not both go to the same place? in verses 5 and 6. No one knows anything about it. It has no history. So no one can put it down or in any way attack it. That's the still point. Furthermore, it will not experience trouble, but the wealthy man will. It has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even long life, 2,000 years of life would not help. Both the stillborn baby and the wealthy man who lives a long life without enjoyment end in the same place. Neither finds the gift of enjoyment. Yet the wealthy man went through all kinds of strife. In verse 7 it says, everyone's trial is for their mouth. Yet their appetite is never satisfied. What advantage have the wise over fools? What do the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Here he's pointing out about how Madison capable of finding joy in his own effort. How hard or how hard work won't do it. All the toil of man is for his mouth. Toil is designed to satisfy, satisfy man's appetite to find pleasure and contentment. But hard work and, desperate, and the desperate drive to satisfy oneself along these lines will never work. It won't produce lasting pleasure. Nor will wisdom or even charm. Or of wisdom, he says, what advantage has the wise man over the fool? You may be wise in your investments, careful with your money, 
You may pursue pleasure moderately, but it's still not going to work. You know, if that's all you have, you are no, no different than a fool. Even a poor man who learns how to attract others to himself by means of his charming personality, knowing how to conduct themselves before others, in this verse, it's still left empty, lonely, and miserable inside. The reason for all this is given in the closing verses of this chapter. In verse 10, it says, Whatever exists has already been named. And what humanity is, has been known. And one, no one can contend with, with someone who is stronger. So the unalterable decree of God, the searcher is telling us here, is that God has decreed that enjoyment cannot be found by effort, by work, or pursuit of pleasure. Enjoyment must be taken as a gift from God's hand. That decree as is, is unalterable as the law of gravity. You may not agree with God about it, you may not like it, but there it is. It can't be changed. Then the searcher points out three things about this. First, God decreed it before man was ever created. It says whatever exists has already been named before it happened. Even man didn't come to be before he was named in the mind and thought of God. And God created this strange law of life before man even appeared on earth. It was all his plan. Secondly, it was decreed in view of what man is. It is known what man is, the verse says. God made us. He knows what we're like how we function, what will satisfy and what won't. You know, in view of that, he set up this decree that enjoyment can't be found from the possession of things. Jesus stressed that very plainly in Luke 12, 15, where he said, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things which he possesses. Then thirdly, the searcher says that it was decreed in spite of man. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. How are you going to change the laws of God? They govern your life, whether you like it or not. Though this may appear to be very much against us, nevertheless, there's nothing we can do about it. Arguing, he goes on to say, doesn't help in verse 11. The more the words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? You know, I, I love the way that C.S. Lewis really, he really said it really well. He said, to argue with God is to argue with the very power that makes it possible to argue at all. How do you change that? You know, the searcher goes on to speak of the weakness of man. There are two reasons why the law can't be changed. First, because God decreed it. And secondly, because man is so limited. It shows us that in verse 12. In verse 12 it says, For who knows what is good for a person in life? During the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow. Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they are gone? He's asking two questions here. First, who knows the true value of life? Where is the man who understands what is good and what is bad? None of us does. So the searcher asks, who knows what is good for man? Do you ever wish for something you thought that was just right for you and then when you finally get what you wish for, it doesn't really apply to you anymore? I read a story about a high school boy that once said, I prayed, Lord, if you could just go, if I could just go out with that beautiful girl, I'd be the happiest boy alive. Then they got acquainted. We went out a few times together and I found myself praying, Lord, if I could just get rid of this girl, I'd be the happiest guy alive. We don't really know what we need. 
You know, who knows what is good for man? We don't. We don't begin to know. Then the second question, who knows what is coming in the future? Who can tell man what will be after him? Who knows what the results of our present choices are going to be? Given our limited narrow vision of what life is, which is true of the smartest of us, what business have we got complaining to God about our life is run or how it's run? So if prosperity is not always good, as he clearly has shown us here, then it's equally true that adversity isn't always bad. Suppose the hard times do come. You know, many good, even great things can come out of that. In chapter 7 is a series of proverbs that list the good things that can happen in affliction. Here's the first one in verse 7-1. A good name is better than a fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. There is a play on words here. The Hebrew word for name here is shim, S-H-E-M. And the Hebrew word for ointment or perfume is shimen, S-H-E-M-E-N. So the searcher is trying to say that a good shim is better than the press of shimen. This, of course, is referring to perfume, which has an ability to attract others. I think that there's nothing more extravagant or more unrelated to reality than a perfume advertisement on television. You know, it tries to convince you that by spraying on a little of a certain perfume on you will cause others to react to, react to you in remarkable ways. <laughs> People of the opposite sex will follow you down the street. You'll step into romantic situations that are filled with sensuous delights. All of this just by buying their perfume. This is ridiculous. I don't know why people watch things like this. In this proverb, the searcher is saying that a good name is truly influential. No, it's not like perfume, which does do, but does not do anything near what it's supposed to do. A good name endures. We'll pass by a lot of garish, you know, a lot of garish looking restaurants. We do this all the time, you know, we go down the street, see in re uh, restaurants, you're, you're hungry, you want to eat, and you go by all these garish restaurants, you know, that promise so many things, until you get to this little hole in the wall that serves good food at a decent price. A good name attracts. Even the poorest among us can have a name for integrity, for trustworthiness. Even though there be affliction and adversity, you not be able to afford Chanel No. 5 and other expensive perfumes, but you can always afford a good name. Another aspect of adversity is, is the lesson that sorrow teaches in verse 2. Verse 2 said, it's better to go to a house of mourning to, than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. You know, the living should take this to heart. That is, when you are confronted with death, you are no longer dealing with the side issues. You are dealing at last with realities. Death leads to realism. Don't will bring sorrow, grief, and mourning. You set aside the shallow, ephemeral aspects of life and start to deal with the facts. Secondly, the searcher says, sorrow leads to gladness. In verse 3 it says, frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. And not only gladness, but wisdom in verse 4 where it says, the heart of the wise is in the house of the morning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. How can that be? How can sorrow, grief, adversity, and pain lead to gladness and wisdom? 
know anybody who's been through a painful trial ever, however, knows that to be true. I do. Most of you do. You come out on the other side a better person. You know, I once read experts or excerpts of uh, John Ehrlichman's testimony of his life, testimony of his life, in his book *Witness to Power*. You know, you probably don't know of him here because it happened back before both of you were born. But the story is appropriate for the times. This guy was under President Richard Nixon, one of the most powerful men in the United States for a while. But he became involved in Watergate, went to jail for some of his dealings during that terrible time. I would like to read to you a few experts of his account of his life before and after the days of Water Watergate, taken from the last chapter of his book. He says, and I will read this to you, when I went to jail nearly two years after the cover-up of the trial, <coughs> excuse me, I had a big self-esteem problem. I was a felon, shorn in scorn, clumping around in a ragged old army uniform, doing pick and shovel work out on the desert. I wondered if anyone thought I was worth anything. For years, I had been able to sweep most of my shortcomings and failures under the rug and not face them. But during the two long criminal trials, I spent my days listening to prosecutors tell juries what a bad guy I was. Then at night, I'd go back to a hotel room and sit alone thinking about what was happening to me. During that time, I began to take stock. He goes on to talk about his marriage, how his marriage had failed about how he went off by himself, seeking solitude in the cold and windy shores of Oregon, where he stayed in a cabin. And it says, I stayed two weeks. Every day I read the Bible, walked on the beach, and sat in front of my fireplace, thinking and sketching, with no outline or agenda. I had no idea where all this was leading or what answers I'd find. But most of the time, I didn't even know what the questions were. I just watched and listened. I was wiped out. I had nothing left that had come that had been of value to me. Honor, credibility, virtue, recognition, profession. Nor did I have the allegiance of my family. I had managed to lose that too. And then he moved to New Mexico and started over in Santa Fe. Here are the closing words of this book. Since about 1975, I've begun to learn to see myself. I care what I perceive about my integrity, my capacity to love and be loved, and my essential worth. I don't miss Richard Nixon very much, and Richard Nixon probably doesn't miss me much either. I can understand that. I've made no effort to be in touch. We had a professional relationship that went as sour as a relationship can and no one likes to be reminded of bad times. Those interludes, the Nixon episodes of my life have, in, have ended. In a paradoxical way, I'm grateful for them. Somehow I had to see all of that and grow to understand it in order to arrive at the place where I find myself now. What a confirmation of the truth that the searcher is telling us here. Through times of sorrow and adversity, we begin to understand the reality of our own lives. This reminds me of my own conversion. You know, I suddenly realized that all I had accomplished in my life and my work was meaningless. I was searching for more and found it in the Bible, which of course led me to Christ. No wonder he adds to this immediately the words of verses 5 and 6, where it says it is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Verse 6, like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. You know, oftentimes a rebuke will help 
more than foolish songs and hollow laughter. Adversity can be a huge benefit to us. Still another benefit is found in verses 7 through 10. Verse 7 says extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. Here he's dealing with the adversity itself. You know, if you suffer an injustice, somebody oppresses you, or if somebody bribes another to attack you, that's hard for the human spirit to bear. You want to strike back. But he says, wait, in verse 8, the end of the matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. And verse 9 says, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. You know, I don't think that anything's been more of a problem in my own life than a short fuse, a quick move to anger. You know, to learn to be patient in spirit is one of the great lessons that adversity can teach in any of us. It's been a great lesson for me. Then he adds to that in verse 10, Don't, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Looking back, it all looks so good. <laughs> but living through those times wasn't any better than they are now. In fact, 10 years from now, you probably look back on today as the good old days. So remember what they were like. Finally, he speaks about wisdom here in verse 11. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. That is, if you learn to be wise and thoughtful about life, it has advantages for you. And then he continues in verse 12. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. He grants that. Out of adversity can come wisdom. And that's its advantages. But now he comes back again to his conclusion in verse 13. It says, consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? <laughs> you know, under the symbol of crookedness come all those things that we call adversities. They're painful experiences, injustices, mistreatment, poverty, sickness, accidents, whatever. Just name it. His question is, who can straighten out what God has made crooked. God did this. As he goes on to say in 14, verse 14a, when times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made one as well as the other. Prosperity adversity. Both come from God's hand. A wise father's heart has given them to you. In the words of the hymn, day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise, I have no worry or for fear. God has given all of these to us. The searcher declares, we have to learn to accept and understand that God has chosen these for us out of love and wisdom. They have a special purpose, which he gives us in these last words. In verse 14b, it says, Therefore no one can discover anything about their future. In other words, God has designed life to be full of the unexpected so that we might realize that we don't control our future. We're not in charge of life. You know, the great satanic lie that suddenly comes to at us at a thousand times a day at that. And is this, we are gods. We are in charge. We can plan. We can direct. We can control. You know, in the freedom of the will, we are God. We are in charge. 
we can plan, we can direct, we can control. In the freedom of the will that God has granted this, there is enough truth to that we easily believe the rest. That we are in ultimate control of everything. But the lesson of scripture driven home and home again and again is that's not true. God is in charge. What he sends us is always designed for benefit. Good or bad. This is the clear teaching of the scripture, both in the Old and New Testament alike. Even through adversity, many have painful aspects. We are to understand that it comes from a loving God and be grateful for it. There's an unknown poet that is written. When God, when God wants to drill a man and thrill a man, and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed, watch his methods, watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him, into trial shapes of clay which only God understands while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands how he bends but never breaks when his good he understands how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him by every act induces him to try his splendor out God knows what he's about. Now you're probably curious where all these poems come from that I've been quoting recently. Her name is Angela Morgan. She wrote her own poetry and she also gathers the poems of others. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for these wise words, Lord. We thank you for the way and which they underscore and underlie the very experiences that we're going through right now. For some among us especially, you may be facing sorrow or deep trouble and heartache. We pray these words may come with encouragement. For some of us who are not given to adversity but prosperity, Lord, we pray that we may understand that these are gifts from the loving God to be accepted with gratitude and with the realization that they can pass away tomorrow. But it's God who gives the gift of enjoyment. Help, help us then to seize this mad rush for material gain and concentrate rather on the understanding and taking from your hand the gifts of God, the gifts of love you sent. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, beloved. Look forward to seeing you again.